My name is Charlie and this is my 2020 review of the Essential Phone. Back in August of 2017, the phone launched at a price tag of $699. And only two months later, the phone dropped to $499. And if you were lucky, you could get the phone for $399 on Cyber Monday. Now, more than two years later, the question is, how is the phone holding up and is it still worth it to buy? The answer for most people is no. But if you're still interested, then stick around. The Essential has a decent amount of weight for a phone of its size, which can be attributed to its ceramic back and titanium frame housing. The ceramic black version I have here is very reflective and is easily prone to fingerprints. This is actually the first phone I have ever used without a case, but since I like to keep all my devices in pristine condition, I installed a full body Skinomi skin protector from Amazon to cover the front, back, and sides of the phone. So far, it's held up well against any scratches and the texture of the skin provides more friction so that the phone doesn't slip out of my hand. The Essential has an IP rating of 55, which means it's only protected from dust and water such as light rain. The left side of the phone is completely clean and allows the phone to stand on one side. The right side of the phone has the volume buttons on the top and power button below. There is only one USB Type-C port on the bottom and no headphone jack. On the back is a top-centered capacitive fingerprint reader, two cameras, an LED flash, and two magnetic pins built for mods. Although I prefer the volume buttons to be on the left side, holding the phone is a perfect feel in the hand because my finger placement rests perfectly on the capacitive fingerprint reader and the power button. Overall, the design of the phone reminds me of a larger version of the iPhone 5, 5S, and SE models. The display is a 5.71 inch IPS LCD display made with Gorilla Glass 5. The aspect ratio is 19 by 10 with a resolution of 1312 by 2560. The Essential is actually the first phone to introduce the notch. I told myself after seeing the iPhone 10 and Pixel 3 XL notch that I would never buy a phone with one. But upon seeing how small it was compared to the other two, I was convinced that it would not be too much of a bother. Coming from the AMOLED display of the Galaxy S7 Edge, the Essentials display was a bit of a downgrade for me because I had to set it to 75 to 80% brightness in order to match the 50% brightness I comfortably saw on my S7 Edge. The phone is running the 2017 Snapdragon 835 processor paired with the Adreno 540 GPU and 4GB of RAM. Still powerful enough to run many of the most popular apps today and keep them open in the background. The only available storage option is 128GB, which is what all phones in 2020 should have as a base option. Transitioning from a phone with only 32GB of internal storage plus a 128GB SD card to a phone with no expandable storage was only okay. Don't get me wrong, 128GB is enough for almost everybody, especially with Google Photos. I just like the encrypted privacy of having an SD card. For those of you who have never used Google Photos with a phone that has expandable storage, Google Photos actually gives you the option to access media from the memory card. I like to keep this option turned off for more personal files I'd prefer to back up offline. Yes, I'm the type of person who still backs up their phone to their computer when I fill up the storage with photos and lots of 4K video. I just feel safer that way. By today's standards, the battery size of 3040 milliamp hours is quite small. When I first acquired the phone, it was two years old, so the battery had obviously already been degraded by the previous owner. When using it, I would often find myself having to recharge once or even twice a day in order for me to get through the full day. This was no big issue for me because I was already accustomed to carrying an external battery pack to recharge my gracefully aging Galaxy S7 Edge, and the 27 watt fast charging capability of the phone allowed it to top back off within half an hour. The lack of wireless charging was somewhat of a disappointment for me because it's a feature on my Galaxy S7 Edge that I actually used a lot. It was a set it and forget it type of feature where you leave your phone on the dock and come back to it with more battery life, even if only slightly. 
Screen on time varies for everyone, and in my experience, I have an average screen on time of 3 to 4 hours with the essential on a single charge. Most of which is from watching YouTube, using social media, and reading articles. I don't play any intensive and high performance demanding games on my phone, but the phone is more than capable of running them. The standby time on the phone is subpar with apps draining the battery in the background when the phone is not in use, so I would often have to top off the battery each morning before my day begins. Of course, battery is also affected by the software. The Essential is up to date with the latest Android 10. Having started from 7.1.1 Nougat, 8.1 Oreo, and then 9.0 Pi, the Essential has gone through three major updates in two years, which is quite impressive considering Andy Rubin promised two years of software updates and three years of security updates. I'm going to be even more impressed if this phone also receives Android 11. And if you're not phased by that, you have to understand that this phone launched in the same year as the Galaxy S8, Note 8, OnePlus 5, and 5T, LG G6, and the Pixel 2 phones. Among many others, only two of those devices I've listed have reached Android 10, and the Essential even beat the Pixel 2 by a week with the December 2019 security patches. When I received this phone, it was still on Android 9.0, but still an upgrade from my S7 Edge's 8.0. Having transitioned from a phone with a physical home button and capacitive buttons, the new navigation gestures on Pi were not to my liking and were a little disorienting. It was like combining all three buttons together with only two thirds of the functions and the back button only appearing when the system deemed it worthy of use. With some courage, I switched to the three on-screen buttons for a few months until I was introduced to the new navigation gestures of Android 10. Android 10 has been a better experience for me, especially with the December security updates that finally allowed the stock launcher to pull down the notification bar from anywhere on the home screen. Sure I can do this with a swipe of the fingerprint reader, but it's always nice to have options like this. Having stock Android has benefited it to have an almost completely lag-free experience. Almost. The only time I ever experienced lag is with Essential's stock camera, which, surprisingly, is the only non-stock Android app out of the box. More on that later. Dismissing the Sprint-only model of the phone, the Essential comes unlocked out of the box, which means it works on both GSM and CDMA carriers in the US and around the world. I used the phone on both T-Mobile and Mint Mobile to test the network quality of the phone. I understand that while they are both on the T-Mobile network, there was a minor difference that bugged me. When I transitioned over to Mint Mobile, everything worked perfectly except for Wi-Fi calling and texting, both of which are crucial for me because my signal at work is almost non-existent. Even after resetting and applying the correct network settings and changing my emergency address on the Mint Mobile app, I had no luck in using the calling and texting over Wi-Fi when I had no service. What I found interesting, though, was the notification bar always had Mint displayed unless it was connected to Wi-Fi. That's when it showed T-Mobile Wi-Fi calling. Despite the lack of consistency between basically the same network, the quality of the front speaker during calls is crystal clear. The front speaker and the bottom firing speaker act as dual speakers when watching videos. The sound combined for both speakers is adequate, but when the volume is turned all the way up, they are quite tinny and not the best to listen to for long periods of time. As for the microphones, I think it's always best to listen to the quality for yourselves. So if you've gotten this far in the video, most of this audio is actually coming from the phone itself. Let me know what you think. Moving on to cameras, the pill-shaped glass on the back of the phone houses two 13 megapixel cameras with f1.9 aperture and laser autofocus. Unlike other smartphones that use a second lens for telephoto or ultra-wide angle, the camera is actually a monochrome sensor. Not only is it used for black and white photos, but it also helps in capturing higher detailed images thanks to its sensitivity to light. Both cameras are capable of recording 4K at 30 frames per second, 1080p at 60 frames per second, and 720p at 120 frames per second, including slow motion. 
The front camera is an 8 megapixel f2.2 aperture that's able to record up to 4K at 30 frames per second. When the phone was first released, the camera app was a laggy mess and the shutter button would stutter with every click. Many reviewers simply tossed the camera aside and neglected to see where the software updates would take it. Fast forward to today, most of those bugs have been fixed. Though I would still agree that the quality of the photos are subpar compared to top of the line pixels and galaxies, many people would still be satisfied with the results. To make the experience better, I installed Google Camera, not only for the better interface and smoother experience, but because of the added features. The difference between the stock camera and Gcam were mostly negligible in terms of the back camera. Sometimes, the stock camera photos turned out better, and other times, the Gcam would come out on top. The front camera is where Gcam is immediately distinguishable. The white balance was much better on the Gcam and provided more contrast and detail than the soft overexposed photos from the stock camera. I did not use the monochrome toggle often, but when I did, I was satisfied with how photos would turn out. I'll do a more detailed comparison between the two camera apps and include the monochrome sensor of the stock camera. The video quality on both cameras are respectable, provided that there's enough light. Otherwise, it suffers tremendously in any low light situation. Stabilization could also use some work, because it sometimes gives off a warped and jelly-like effect that digital stabilization tends to make. What makes this phone unique? Similar to Motorola, Essential has created its own magnetic pin design to allow for its own special mods, though only one official accessory has actually been released. The Essential 360 camera is boasted to be the world's smallest 4K 360 degree camera that captures 3D spatial audio using four built-in microphones. This being my first 360 camera, my first thoughts were, wow, this is so cool. I'm gonna record everything like this now and make use of my Gear VR headset. But after the honeymoon phase of using a new lens was over, my initial first impressions gradually declined. The grainy photos and videos did not meet my expectations of what 4K ought to look like. The constant app crashes and sometimes unexpected shutdowns were a nuisance when I first used it in Android Pie. Even with the Android 10 update, nothing has been done with the ridiculous amount of power the fans alone drained from the phone. Every minute of use is equivalent to about 2% of battery life. I knew I definitely would need to bring a portable battery pack when using this mod. As much as I'm annoyed by these shoddy drawbacks, I'm still in awe at our ability to create material with a device this small. Call it a gimmick if you must, but it can only get better from here. Overall, how was my experience with the phone? This phone was actually my first experience with Android 10, and with that update came the RCS update for Android Messages. Before the update occurred though, I manually turned on RCS using a guide. Though I have only been able to use RCS or chat with one other person so far, I'm quite happy with the direction that Google is finally taking with Android's messaging platform. On both Wi-Fi and cellular data, my friend and I were able to see when the other was typing. Though it's pretty slow to come out, I'm sure it would be much better in the future when this feature comes to more devices. A shortcoming that I must disclose is the incomplete compatibility between the Essential and my Gear S3 Frontier LTE. But that's mostly through the fault of Samsung's proprietary software. Even though I get all the app notifications on my watch, and I am able to reply back. The default Android Messages app is not synchronized with the default Samsung Messages app on the Gear S3. What this means is, messages from my phone are not saved to the Messages app on my watch. On top of that, I cannot create or start a message on my watch because it will use the number that is associated with the watch and not the number on my phone. I have to wait for someone else to text me first before being able to reply to them on my watch. Another flaw that has me wanting to go back to Samsung is Samsung Pay. I stuck through with this pair because after three installation attempts, 
I was able to download the appropriate plugins needed in order to use Samsung Pay on my watch. Because Samsung Pay is also a Samsung only feature, you can't directly add cards to the watch. I had to find a way to enable the Samsung Pay directory in the Galaxy Wearable app on the Essential. Only after doing so was I able to scan my cards to the phone and send them to my watch. Bluetooth was also an issue when it came to pairing the Essential with both my watch and my car. Whenever I would take a call through my car's Bluetooth, the phone's Bluetooth would disconnect and reconnect again on my watch. Sometimes, it would reconnect to my car just fine, but other times, I would have to manually select my car again under Bluetooth settings. Quite dangerous when you're driving. This was never an issue for my S7 Edge. I would take a call from either the watch or my car, and it would stay on that device. Regarding all that's been said, is the Essential phone still worth it for you to buy? I already said in the beginning of the video that for most people, the answer would be no. If you're an avid user of Snapchat or Instagram, the camera on this phone is not for you. Because those apps are not optimized for Android to begin with, the shutter speed with the camera is slow and causes photos to be blurry unless you're really still. And when you're in a dimly lit environment that requires flash, both apps miss the front firing screen flash and your selfie is still left in the dark after your eyes have already been blinded. So unless you want to manually upload your photos after taking them with a Google camera app, then this phone is not for you. If you're a parent that would like to give your kids a cheap but powerful device for gaming, then this phone would work just fine. I believe that kids don't need a $1,000 phone in order to play games and watch YouTube kids. So this $160 alternative would work just fine. I would recommend this phone to people who are interested in testing the waters of 360 degree photos and videos on a device you can fit in your pocket. I would also recommend it to people who are just nostalgic about technology like I am. Again, this is the first phone to come out with the notch and is no longer even available to buy on the official Essential website. So, if you're still interested in getting this phone, one of the easiest and safest places to buy it is from Amazon or Swappa. You can even find a 360 camera on Amazon for about $25. That's $20 cheaper than on the official website and one eighth of its original price. If you're lucky, you may even get one that still has a healthy battery because I would not recommend trying to change the battery yourself. If you decide to get one, Comment your reason down below and let me know which color you get. Thanks for watching.